O oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shining afar through shadows dim, giving the light for those who long have gone, and guiding the wise men on their way unto the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. O oh, beautiful star. Sing number 554, 554. You may have to use your books. 554. Five,
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for another opportunity to gather here tonight with other brothers and sisters in Christ and learn more about your word, study your word, and be taught a lesson, and hopefully, hopefully learn how we can be better followers of you. Dear Lord, we, at this time, I ask a, a blessing upon the church worldwide. Dear Lord, we know that there's a lot of a lot of tribulation going on in the world. We pray for the church and we pray for its growth and both spiritually and also in number. Pray for our church here locally, dear Lord. We pray that you will give us strength and, and if it be your will, increase our numbers and especially increase our spirit, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we pray at this time for all those that have fallen away. Dear Lord, we pray that we can be a good influence on them Dear Lord, and hopefully one day bring them back to you. Dear Lord, we pray for all those who are, are not yet Christians, that, that we can teach them and be a good influence on them and hopefully, hopefully encourage them to become a Christian one day so that we all can go to heaven. Dear Lord, we're, we're thankful for our elders that labor here with us and for us. Dear Lord, we, we ask that you would, would strengthen them and Give them wisdom as they lead us down the right path. Dear Lord, we're thankful, so thankful for your word that you have given us so that we can know what we need to do to go to heaven and be followers of you. Dear Lord, we're thankful for prayer. We're thankful for the opportunity to be able to talk to you as our Father. Dear Lord, we're, we're thankful most of all for Jesus. and We're thankful for his love for us and his willingness to die on the cross and your willingness to send him to that cross, to die that cruel death, shed his blood so that we can have forgiveness of our sins. Dear Lord, we pray that you'll go with us tonight through this service. Please be with Chad. Help him to remember the things that he has studied to, to bring to us tonight. Dear Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to mark number 270-270, that'll be the invitation song. Before Chad comes and speaks to us, we'll sing number 456, 456. If you'd like to stand, please.
This is our fourth Sunday night in October, and believe it or not, we are uh, back on schedule with the book of the month. That's what we're going to look at this evening. We are on the book of 2 Samuel, at least for, let's see, this is October for at least for two more months. Uh, it'll be easier to keep track because you can always just go by the number of books and the number of months. Uh, but as, as we get on into further years, then it, it'll change a little bit. But uh, so far, we've, we've done these just in, in order. I, that may change at some point, but uh, so far that has, that has worked, and so that's the way we've been doing these. But we're on 2 Samuel. Debated doing 2 Samuel uh, separately from, I mean, I debated on doing second, first and 2 Samuel together. But I decided to, uh, I decided to go ahead and, and separate them. So we are looking at 2 Samuel tonight. Obviously, we looked, uh, I was going to say last month, but technically we looked this month, the first Sunday of this month, at 1 Samuel, and that was our uh, book of the month for September, but we got delayed by a week, and so we put that into first Sunday in October. Now we're looking at 2 Samuel. This is, I guess you would say, a continuation. It, it literally, in, in the original, they were one book, and so it almost seems... Uh, not quite right to call it a continuation because it really is uh, it, it, there are, they were one unit originally and so they were split up for, for space as we mentioned last uh, and, and we studied 1 Samuel the scroll was so long it was so cumbersome and so they were split into two 1 and 2 Samuel uh, same thing with Kings, same thing with Chronicles but we're looking at 2 Samuel and as we did with 1 Samuel we want to notice the divisions this thing is, is acting up on me again, Brian. It doesn't want to show. Divisions of 2 Samuel would be, uh, we could basically get it into, really, two. Two different divisions. David's fame, thank you, that did it, and David's shame. First ten chapters deal with David's fame, and you see David's, I won't say his rise to prominence, because we saw that to some extent in 1 Samuel. But you really see it in 2 Samuel when he, when he takes over the kingdom and, and he rises and, and has such success. And then, of course, the latter part of the book, chapters 11 to 24, almost, almost half, deals with David's shame. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But breaking this down a little bit further, and this is a, a very general overview, obviously, but there's a lament over Saul's death. David is genuinely, he's not putting on... Uh, you know, it, it's, it's our trunks of treat night. I know that's on a lot of the young folks' minds. But David is not putting on a mask. He's not putting on a disguise. He really was genuinely upset over Saul's death. He knew that was God's anointed. On at least two different occasions, he had the opportunity very easily to kill Saul. And he said, I will not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to do it. And so he was upset over Saul's death. Over and over again, David's been told the kingdom is going to be yours. You would think, and it might even be tempting. I know it would have to be tempting for me. I can only speak for myself, but it might be tempting in that situation to think, well, finally, he's gone. He's out of the way. But David didn't think that way. He, he knew he wanted Saul to do what was right. He knew there were some issues there with Saul as well as Samuel did. And so he lamented over Saul's death. Then you have David as king over Judah only, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I don't know that I actually put this in any of my slides, but I, we've mentioned it several times before. Uh, David's reign was 40 years. I think most, most people uh, remember that. We've, we've talked about that a lot. David, Solomon, and of course before David, King Saul, 40 years each. So 40, 40, 40. If you can remember 40, you've got the first three kings down as far as the length of their reign. But David had about seven years where he just reigned over Judah. And then there was, a, there was sort of a period of civil war, and that's, that's our next point here, chapter 2, verse 12, on into chapter, or through chapter 6. <clears throat> there was a civil war. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was made king by Abner, who was, we might call, a general of his forces. And so there was this period of civil war, Joab being David's main general, Abner being Ishbosheth's main leader of, of the troops. And so they, they did battle. And they're fighting for the kingdom. Abner wants Ishbosheth to be on the king, uh, to be on the throne, and uh, Joab wants David to be on the throne. And of course, there was really never any 
question as to who was going to come out on top, at least in hindsight we see that, because God had set David on the throne. That was God's decision. That was ultimately the way it was going to fall out. In chapter 3, you have Ishbosheth, who makes a really foolish, dumb accusation against Abner. Abner was a great, great leader. And so he made this silly and foolish accusation, and it upset Abner. And so it upset him so badly that he defected, and he went and joined forces with David. But you see, in, in really in 2 Samuel especially, and you're going to see it a lot in the Kings as well, that there are people, there are people in these, in these, in these books and in these times that, what, I mean, they're like people now. People haven't changed all that much. They, they don't like competition sometimes. They, they have pride. They have ego. And that was Abner's, or Joab, rather. That was his problem. So Abner defects. And he tells Ishbosheth, uh, you know, with, my parents used to say sometimes, or I'd hear people say back home, you know, say, you, you've, you've really split your britches with me this time. <laughs> you ever hear that expression? Uh, Abner basically says that to Ishbosheth. He says, you've split your britches with me, and I'm going, I'm helping David, and I'm going to make sure he ends up on the throne. But Joab doesn't want Abner because that's, at least as he views it, competition. And so what ends up happening is he kills Abner. And again, David helps to unite the kingdom because he shows genuine, genuine concern over what happened to Abner. He knows it wasn't right. In fact, he, he even chastises Joab for what he did. But there's, that's all during this period of, of civil war. And of course, David ends up being asked by the rest of the, the tribes to be king over them. God will make a covenant with David in chapter 7. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. And then, of course, the high point of David's reign is chapters 8 through 10. Uh, this is the zenith of the reign of David. And then you come to David's shame, and you have the sin and the repentance. Uh, of course, the sin with Bathsheba, chapter 11, the rebuke by Nathan, the prophet, and, of course, his repentance it goes on into chapter 12, verse 14. As a result of that, the sword is not going to depart from his kingdom, he's told, and that's exactly what happens. We see from chapter 12, verse 15, on through 18, 33. And then, of course, David's final days, where, as one fellow put it, he was troubled but triumphant, chapters 19 to 24. Now, an alternate division of the book, I found three different ones of these that were pretty good. Uh, another division that I saw... <clears throat> had chapters 1 to 10 as David's early success, his sin, chapter, chapters 11 and 12, and then his sorrow in chapters 13 to 24. Uh, that's a little bit shorter, more compact. And then the third one is triumph, 1 to 10, transgression, chapter 11, and troubles that followed, chapters 12 to 24. I want you to notice something, and this, we've talked about this before, when you have transgression, just as surely as night follows day, troubles will follow. That's just inevitable. It happened with David. It happens to this day. When we go against God's will for our lives, troubles follow. They're not always even immediate, but they follow. Just as surely as night follows day. So those are <clears throat> the divisions of the book. Let, let's talk about the purpose of the book. Uh, Really, in the, in the immediate purpose, other than giving us, you know, it's, it's in the big picture, looking at the big picture of the Bible, it's, it's sort of establishing the united kingdom, the throne of David, and it's, it's linking that lineage of the Messiah. That's, that's the big picture in the Bible. But more, in, in the more immediate context, it's basically a un, pretty much uninterrupted narrative of David's reign as king. That, that's what you've got, and that's, and that's why you see when, when you're going to divide Samuel, this, where they divided it made a good spot to divide the book because you have the death of Saul, <clears throat> and now David begins his reign, and the rest of this focuses on David. Uh, a lot of this we talk about, we, some of this we covered already. Saul was dead, and there was a civil war. Uh, Ishbosheth was murdered, uh, chapter 4. I don't believe I mentioned that earlier. David begins his reign over the whole kingdom in chapter 5. He conquers Salem or Zion. We know it as Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is going to play a prominent role. You don't need me to tell you that in the rest of your Old Testament and even on into the New Testament up until the destruction of Jerusalem when it is utterly and finally destroyed in A.D. 70. 
So this is where Jerusalem comes into possession of the Hebrews, the Jewish people. David goes and conquers it. He also, in chapter 5, defeats the Philistines. He returns the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem in chapter 6. Of course, most of us are familiar with the events surrounding that. Uzzah, as they're transporting the Ark, they're transporting it in an improper way. Uh, there's no indication that David was just trying to ignore the commands of God, but he didn't do it God's way. Instead of having Levites carry it with the stakes through the rings as they're supposed to, they decide to put it on an ark, I mean on a cart. And so the oxen stumble. Uzzah sees the, the ark jostling and thinks maybe it's going to fall, and he reaches out to touch it, and he, he falls dead because no one was allowed to touch the ark. And, of course, there are a lot of great lessons that we could learn just from that event, but that was during the bringing of the ark of the covenant to Jerusalem. Chapter 7 is God's covenant with David. David gets sort of, we would, we would say he's established at this point. <clears throat> and he says, uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing. David basically says, this is not right. I dwell in a nice house. I live in a nice palace. And the ark of God, which represented God's presence among his people, the ark of God dwells in a tent. And he said, that's not right. I'm going to build God a house. Now, now, he knew God is spirit, and he couldn't build a house that God would live in as we live in a house. But he wanted a house to represent God's presence among the people in, in which they would store the Ark of the Covenant. And Nathan says to him, what? Go ahead. And, of course, God then appears to Nathan and says, no, it's, it's, not, it's not a go. Because David has been a man of war, he's been... Uh, much bloodshed under his reign and so he's not going to do this did I say Nathan? it was Gad Gad the prophet um, he says we're not, David's not going to build this house but in a kind of a play on words or something there he says I'm going to build you a house David God says that I'm going to build you a house and again we're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a moment David's kindness to Mephibosheth is seen in chapter 9 this is interesting because David says is there not anybody left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness. Why? Why did he want to show kindness? Because of the bond that he had with Jonathan, his best friend. He wanted to show kindness for Jonathan's sake. And so he says, is there anyone? Well, there's Mephibosheth. He's lame. His, his, his nurse was fleeing, and she dropped him, and so he's lame on both feet. Can you imagine how Mephibosheth must have felt when somebody came to him and said, David, the king, wants to see you? What are you going to do if you're Mephibosheth? You can't run. Nine times out of ten, in fact, ten times out of ten, in that time, in that day and age, when your dad or, or a relative of yours was the king, your dad was in line to receive the throne, and a new guy rises to power and he wants to see you, it's not to say, hey, how you doing? It's to kill you because you might be a threat to the throne. Many times it didn't matter if they were lame. They would be killed. So I can only imagine how he must have felt as he appeared before David, but David said... I want you to sit and eat at my table for the rest of your life. I want to take care of you because of his friendship with Jonathan and honoring that friendship. Uh, David's sin and repentance, of course, in chapters 11 and 12. Absalom's treason. This came about as a result of David's sin. Really, we could even go back to chapter 13 and talk about Amnon's treachery. Uh, falling in love, lust would be more accurate with his half-sister Tamar and raping her. And then, you know, it says he, he was just so... Uh, sick over this and, and his, his friend supposedly Jonadab who helped him come up with this plan by which he rapes her and then he says he hated her more than what he thought he loved her before just how awful that fella had gotten this is a result these are consequences of David's sin of course the child that was conceived by Bathsheba they lost that child uh, David of course makes one of those statements that many of us have uh, quoted or heard quoted at, at many a funeral where David says in 2 Samuel 12, 23, I can't bring the child back, but I can go to him, understanding that this life is not the end. And so we can go to those loved ones who are faithful or in the case of a child, someone who is safe in the arms of the Lord, never having uh, been accountable and, and sinned, then we can go to them, even though we can't bring them back to this side of eternity. And so a lot of things happening in David's house as a consequence of that sin. Of course, Solomon is born, I believe that's also in chapter 13. 
And then you have Absalom. And his, Absalom, first of all, he murders Amnon because of the incident with Tamar. He decides he's going to get revenge. He takes that into his own hands. He murders Amnon. You see how the sword's not departing from the house of David? Then he commits this treason, and he decides, I'm going to be king. And he steals the hearts of the people. He stands in the gate, and people come with these matters. And, and a a Absalom is right there, and he says, well, you know, if I was king, here's what I would do. And people are sitting, you know, you can see people going, yeah, that, that's a pretty good idea. That's a pretty good way to handle it. But, you know, I'm not the king, so what, what can I do? And so he's, he's stealing the hearts of the people. Very, very sneaky way of taking, taking the hearts of the people. And of course, you go to on, this goes on for a few chapters, and when you get to chapter 18, Absalom is defeated. David even tells them as they go out to fight against Absalom, deal gently with the young man Absalom for my sake. They didn't deal gently with him. <laughs> they, they killed him. And given, given the chance, they, they killed him, understanding that, you know, and I, I'm, I'm telling you Chad's opinion here, but I, I sort of believe that's kind of what had to be done in that situation. I believe they understood that from a, from a military standpoint. That's what had to be done. David is so grieved, he, he goes around, we would say he's kind of moping. And in chapter 19, uh, Joab threatens, I'm going, I'm going to leave you, and if you don't, I'm going to defect too, like Abner did. If you don't stop this, you are destroying the morale of the people. You're, you're moping over your son who was rebelling against you. You go back and take your throne and show the people that you're their king. And so David finally kind of gets his mind right and, and goes back to Jerusalem You've got closing thoughts, closing words of David, closing deeds, uh, all kind of summed up in chapters 22 uh, to 24. Talking about the man David, there's a lot that we could say about David, obviously, that we just don't have time for. The name David means beloved, means beloved. He was beloved of God, he was beloved of his people, of his soldiers, and so on we could go. He obviously, Acts 13, 22, this is a man after God's own heart. Now, it doesn't mean he was perfect. We, we know that just from this book that we're studying tonight. He was not a man who was sinless, but he was a man after God's own heart. And you see that come out so much in the life of David as we review it just right here in the book of 2 Samuel. You see it so much. Perhaps the greatest king of Israel, there's no question, if you're looking at the United Kingdom before the kingdom divides, there's no question this man, David, was their absolute greatest king. Now, Solomon, under his reign, the territory, is, territory conquered and ruled is going to be greater, the, the greatest ever in the history of the nation. The wealth is going to be greater, the greatest ever in the history of the nation. However, Solomon had some, some problems. He married foreign wives. They stole his heart away. Uh, I've told you all before, I like to believe that Ecclesiastes is sort of his open letter of repentance to the world. I, I like to think that. Hopefully, Solomon got himself straightened out before he died. But we know for a long time there, his wives, these foreign wives and their idolatrous ways, they turned his heart away from God. David, he served God faithfully all the days of his life. 1 Kings 15 tells us, though, verse 5, I believe it is, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So there was that incident in his life where he, he openly rebelled against God. But other than that, this is a man that served God with everything he had all his life. Again, it's not to say he was perfect, but he was striving every day of his life. It is amazing when you study the life of David to see how interweaved God was in his life, in every aspect of his life. Uh, this is not a man who had... The, the secular realm and the religious realm, or, or he had matters of the kingdom, military matters, and then spiritual matters. It all permeated his life. Spirituality, being a, a child of God, that's who David was. He served God first and foremost, whether it was in his military endeavors, whether it was in uh, his, his civil matters as a ruler, whether it was in spiritual service to God. He he was constantly serving God. And you want to see a man who is messed up emotionally, mentally, you read the penitential Psalms and you see how it grieved David to be, to be out of fellowship with God. I, I've told people before, I, I don't know uh, what I would do if I were in a situation where I could not be with my brethren, where I could not be at worship. 
Sister Nancy Allen was telling me uh, just not too long ago she's she's had this surgery and it has a, a very difficult time getting out. In fact, I don't I don't believe she's been able to be with us in worship yet. But she was telling me I talked to her on the phone one day and she said that's one of the hardest things that I've been dealing with. This is not being able to be there. God just permeated David's life, and and for him to be out of fellowship with God and knowing that his life wasn't right during that time period, it was eating him up. And you see a man who's very very troubled when you read those penitential psalms, and, and that's the way it ought to be. That's, that's God's goodness leading us to repentance, and thankfully it did that for David. But this, this man was a great, great king of Israel. He, he became, we might say, the measuring stick for all other kings. In fact, God himself will sometimes say of other kings, you, you've not walked before me, you've not walked in my ways as my servant David did. It's going to talk about a... a I just went blank. It's either Abijam or Abijah. It's one of those. I think it's in 1 Kings 16 where it actually says that. He did not follow the Lord with all his heart, as did his father David. You see how David has become kind of the standard. Not that he is the standard, but just saying, hey, here's a man that though he wasn't perfect, he strove every day to follow God. What a great, great king and what a great man he was. He established the capital in Jerusalem, as I just mentioned. You also have him establishing the temple site in chapter 24. At the end of the book, it's often kind of overlooked as people are finishing out the book. David numbers the people. He sinned in numbering the people. I don't know why he did this. Uh, His captain tried to talk him out of it, but he went ahead with it anyways, and it displeased God, and so... God gave him, you know, three choices to choose which punishment was going to come. And David said, well, I'm in the Lord's hand. Let him choose. And so this plague breaks out. And David is going to offer a sacrifice to help stay the plague. And he comes to the threshing floor of Arona, the Jebusite. And he says, tell tell me how much so I can offer a sacrifice here. David sees this angel of the Lord with his sword drawn standing in it it, you know that had to be a terrifying sight and I don't think any of us could ever possibly even come close to describing what that must have looked like to be able to see that and so he he says I'm going to buy this threshing floor and I'm going to offer a sacrifice here and Arona says look you're buying this to offer sacrifice to the Lord you just take it you you just take it it's it's yours it's free and I, I, I love what David says here he says no I'm going to pay you for it because I will not offer sacrifice to the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. Brother Wendell Winkler used to say many, many times years ago, a religion that costs you nothing is worth exactly what you pay for it. Sacrifice. David says, I will not offer sacrifice to the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. And so he purchased the threshing floor. He offered the sacrifice. The plague was stayed. And that threshing floor is the future site. Solomon will be the one who builds the temple there, as we already mentioned. But that's the future site of the house of God, the temple, that we read so much about in the Old Testament. Uh, David ranks with Abraham and Moses as one of the three peaks of the Old Testament. Uh, Just just high points in the history of God's people in the Old Testament. Uh, Interesting, he stands about halfway between Abraham and Christ. He's about a thousand years removed from Abraham. He's about a thousand years before Jesus Christ coming into the world. So that's an interesting point about David. Uh, His two greatest accomplishments, Frank Dunn says in his book, Know Your Bible, were the kingdom and the Psalms. Never thought about that before, but I suppose that would probably be fair to say. He he wrote a number of the Psalms and a great, great accomplishment there, but also the, the kingdom that he established. Now, not everybody followed in his footsteps as far as following the Lord, but, you know, obviously David had no control over that. They had to make their own choices. But great, great accomplishments. Uh, David is a man where we see, yes, he committed a grievous sin, but let's not forget about the great repentance that you see in David. Here's a man that when he was confronted, he made things right. No doubt a very difficult situation for Nathan the prophet to come to him and have to confront him and say, you've committed this horrible sin, but he did. He confronted him, and David, to his credit, he said, I've sinned, and he made things right. All right, let's go talk about message of 2 Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel shows the failures of, of Saul, and hopefully you remember that from what we talked about last week, or last month. Uh, 1 Samuel shows the failure of Saul, 
2 Samuel shows the success, really success is, of David. It's not, you know, again, it's not a, again, that's not to say that he never messed up, but overall we see his success. Uh, the Bible, in pointing out David's success, though, does not hesitate to show us his shortcomings, his flaws. And that's one of the evidences of inspiration, by the way. Uh, other books try to kind of, we would say, sugarcoat the flaws of its heroes. Not the Bible. The Bible makes it very clear these were men. Only one sinless man ever walked, ever lived on this earth, and that's, of course, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So David, while a good man, he had his flaws. The Bible doesn't seek to cover that up. But he responded to sin very differently when you compare him with Saul. Saul was obstinate and, and sometimes just seemed to fail to take sin seriously. Whereas David understood, you know, on, the, on the occasion with Uriah and Bathsheba, it took being confronted by Nathan the prophet. But he understood, he said, he said I've sinned and I, I want, you know, in Psalm 51, he, he's, that's one of those penitential psalms, he says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Here's a man begging God, please take me back. I just want to be right with you again, Lord. So you see how different his attitude towards sin is. The overall theme of the book is the establishment of the household or the house of David. When we talk about Jesus in 2 Samuel, really there, there's basically one major spot that we could talk about. We could talk about some smaller ones, but turn to chapter 7 of this book. 2 Samuel chapter 7. And look at verse 11. It was Nathan the prophet. I, I should have listened to myself to begin with. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I said Nathan, and then I thought I had it wrong. It was Gad, but it was Nathan. As I mentioned, David says, I'm going to build a house for the Lord. Nathan says, go ahead. And then David says, or God says to Nathan, uh, no, this, this, David's not going to do this. But in, in beginning at the latter, latter part of verse 11, you're going to see this is a major theme in the Old Testament from this point forward. And then when you get to the New Testament, it's a major theme that they look back to. Uh, you know, again, David wanted to build the house. Nathan originally gives him the go-ahead. And so God says, I'm going to build you a house. At the end of verse 11, the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days shall be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, some of this, obviously, is looking at Solomon. He's going to build this house, but then there's another house that's being discussed here, a spiritual house, and that's obviously talking about Jesus. But he goes on and says, I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house, David, thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Well, David, his physical throne is no longer with us. And we understand that's a, that's a spiritual fulfillment. That's talking about the throne of Christ who sits on the throne of David, not on this earth, nor will he ever sit on David's throne on this earth. He sits on the throne of David now, reigning over his kingdom, the church. And so that's the... Uh, that's the prophecy, and there are a lot of New Testament passages that show us this is fulfilled uh, in, in Jesus and in the New Testament. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 talks about the book of the generations of, of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So Jesus being mentioned there is the son of David. Luke 1.32, uh, talking about Jesus, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So that's another example. And then you come over to uh, the book of Acts, chapter 2. In verse 30, and he says uh, there in that verse, Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Uh, these are just a few. Hebrews 1, 5 quotes uh, from this section of 2 Samuel and also mentions uh, that concept of Christ being raised up to sit on David's throne. God says, David, you're not going to build me a house. Your son Solomon will do that. But God says, I'm going to build you a house. It's a spiritual house. And it will never, ever pass away. And the great thing is that today, tonight, you and I, if we are Christians, we're part of that household of God. So interesting uh, seeing Christ in 2 Samuel. Let's, let's close out with some lessons 
that we learn from 2 Samuel. There are a number of lessons that we could take from this book. Uh, my, sometimes I look at books and I say, well, how do I, uh, I want to choose some big lessons from this. 2 Samuel is one where I had, to, I had to start culling stuff out. There's so many things that we could talk about as lessons from the book. There's the joy of consecration and devotion to God's service. We see that over and over again in 2 Samuel. How happy David's life is, how uh, not necessarily that every circumstance is wonderful, but the, over, the, the abiding joy that is in his life when he is serving God faithfully and God's people when they're serving him faithfully. But there are some cautionary tales in the book as well. Hosea 8, verse 7, the prophet there talks about Israel, and he said, speaking for Jehovah, he said, they have sown the wind, they're going to reap the whirlwind. David sowed the wind, and he reaped the whirlwind. I wonder how many times David sat in the dark of night, maybe just lying in his bed, and thinking to himself, oh, if I could just go back and redo that one day on the rooftop when I saw that lady, and if I'd just turned away, walked away, never sent for her, so many things happened to David as a result of that choice when he said, bring me that woman. And he ended up even murdering her husband. I wonder just how many times, you know, it was constantly in his thoughts. And he said, I wish I could take it back. Sometimes we sow the wind and we reap the whirlwind. Another lesson we learn, even for a king, even for God's anointed, Make no mistake, Galatians 6, 7 says, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You see both in the life of David. You see him sowing to the flesh in this incident in his life with Bathsheba and, and killing Uriah and lying about it and trying to cover it up. You, you see sowing to the flesh. But you also see many times in David's life sowing to the Spirit and reaping accordingly. Oh, if we could just get our children, but even as adults, if we could get that through our noggins. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Numbers 32, 23, in a different context, Moses says to two and a half tribes of Israel, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, if you don't do what you say you're going to do, what you've given your word you're going to do, be sure your sin will find you out. But there is a concept there that sin has a way of finding us out. David had committed this act, and maybe he felt like he'd covered it up. I mean, he had killed Uriah. He'd waited some, some time to give her some grieving time, and then he'd taken Bathsheba as his wife, and so now it's okay. She's going to have this child and Nathan comes to him and reminds him, God knows. God hasn't forgotten. You haven't covered up anything from God. Your sin has found you out. And oh, the consequences that he had to face. And that's another lesson that we learn from the book. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand, take heed lest he fall. It's easy to feel like, well, I'm a faithful servant of the Lord. Maybe David just got too comfortable. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us for sure why. But I know there's, there's a lesson there that let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There's a saying, it's not, it's not a Bible verse, it's not found in the Bible, but the concept is certainly there. But there's a saying that people sometimes say, idle hands are the devil's workshop. I hope I got that right. I think that's how it goes. But it's the idea that here's David when he's on the run from Saul. Saul's trying to kill him. He's, he's, he's just a sheep, uh, a shepherd out in the wilderness. You know, he's, he's just a nobody, we'd say. And he's faithful to God. When does he fall from grace, at least for a time? It's when he has the kingdom. He's conquered his enemies. Life is good. He's enjoying the fruits of his labor. And those idle hands get him into trouble, don't they? We need to be careful. I've heard this saying for years, and it certainly is a lesson that we learn from the life of David in 2 Samuel. Sin will take you further than you ever wanted to go. It will keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay, and it will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. Oh, the troubles that came into David's life because of the sin, the open rebellion against God. We can make a mistake, and there will be consequences for it, but 
How much worse when, in the, as in the case of David in that instance, just openly rebel against God and go against what you know is right? What a lesson we learned there. One of the great lessons, though, and don't overlook this in 2 Samuel. In the big picture of the kingdom, it's easy to forget it in looking at the coming Messiah, but the coming Messiah is coming to teach them and us if you're alive and you're mentally capable, you can come back. You can get your life right with the Lord. It's so easy for people. I see people, and no doubt we've all known people, that they've gone so far away from what is right. And I've heard people say, I can't come back. I've gone too far. When you go that far, brother, you can't come home. There's no help for me. Yes, there is. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, this is one of those penitential psalms. David says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, lays it not to his account, in other words, and in whose spirit there is no guile. If you're alive and able, you can have your sins covered. Not even in promise. If you were living in the Old Testament, it was just in promise. But if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you can come and you can have your sins covered not by the blood of an animal, not just rolling them forward for another year, but you can have them covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. He offered himself once for all, Hebrews 9 and other passages tell us, that we might have life. You can come confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God, repent, turn away from sins, be baptized into Christ. That blood will wash away your sins. He'll add you to his church, Acts 2, 47. Maybe as a Christian, like David, you've, You've turned away from God. Maybe it's something that you can take care of between you and the Lord. Maybe it's something that's of a public nature. Maybe we all can be encouraged by 2 Samuel to take heed lest we fall. Maybe we find ourselves in a situation where we're faithful to the Lord. But let's take heed lest we fall. Well, what a great lesson as we close out and extend heaven's invitation. God wants you to know. God wants me to know. He wants us all to know. And he teaches us that through his great servant, David. You can, you can make some bad mistakes but if you turn to God with all your heart and you come to him on his terms you can come home maybe you need to come home won't you do it while we stand and sing to encourage you Thank you, Chad, for those fine lessons today, for all those that are public part in our worship, for those that are visiting. We have several. We're so happy to see each of you, especially those who are visiting with us. If you're not here this morning, please take a moment, fill out a card, and leave that with one of us as you depart. But we will remind you, hopefully you've come, that you're well aware that we have trunks of treats immediately after our evening service. Um, Johnny, what's the uh, protocol for that? 
Okay, as soon as uh, the closing prayer, if you'll just kind of hang out where you are, Johnny will come and give us specific instructions as to what needs to be done concerning the young'uns and the trunks of treats that will be happening immediately after our closing prayer this evening. Remind you of those that are on our prayer list. Again, good to see Janice Jones here with us again tonight. Novella Spake also feeling well. Glad to see her. Pam Wilkes as well. You're asked to remember uh, Ken Glover's daughter, Robin Glover Hansen, who lives in Illinois. She's scheduled to have surgery uh, October the 31st. Also, Paula Kittle. This is the granddaughter of Aline Brannon and uh, Aline's daughter, Peggy's daughter. She's also scheduled to have some major back surgery this week. Are there others that we should mention? Yes, there is one other. Frida Gray uh, fell at her home yesterday, but she's doing okay. They think that she might have fractured a small bone in her wrist, but she's doing okay. I talked to uh, Sue earlier. Any others? Good Samaritans will be visiting next Sunday after the morning worship service. That's November the 2nd. Uh, plan to stay after the morning worship service and eat and then go visiting at the nursing home in Carrollton. For more information, see Eric or Mary. The Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. Once we stand to sing, go through this door, second door on the left, and there will be someone there waiting to serve you. Again, our next service, Wednesday at 7. Should we mention anything else? Again, if you'll just stay seated after our closing prayer, Brother Johnny will come and give us some specific instructions concerning our trunks of treats. Final song, Brother. 556 five, will be our final song. If you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. Somewhere morning. for another day of life and God we thank you for all the many blessings that you've given us in this life we thank you for your love and your patience with us and we pray that you would please continue to have patience with us God I thank you for the congregation here at Bremen and pray that you would please continue to bless it and all of its members I pray that you would guide us all through our walk our daily walk and our spiritual life and I pray that you would please be with us always I pray that you would help us to have a safe night tonight at the Trunk or Treat, help everyone to have fun and to be safe, and we pray that you would be with us always, and we thank you for your son, Jesus, and we thank you for sending him to die for us, and again, we thank you for all the many things that you've done for us, all your blessings, and this we pray in your son, Jesus' name, amen. All right, I think we got more than one princess and maybe a couple of monsters out there, and everybody's ready to go. We thank you for your participation in our Trunks of Treats this year. I want to say thank you to Rachel and Brian, who did the decorations in the Fellowship Hall, which you will see after our uh, Trunk or Treating. Uh, so here's the plan. We will 
take a few minutes and change into costumes and meet on the front steps for a group picture at no later than 15 minutes after. And as soon as we get the picture snapped, we'll go and uh, make the rounds and get some candy for about 30 or 30 minutes or so, and then we'll come back and line up in the hall uh, here where the library is for the parade of costumes. And when we line up for the parade of costumes, we will do youngest to oldest, youngest to oldest trick-or-treaters. Um, so you guys can station yourselves if you're going to take pictures as they come into the fellowship hall. Uh, and then there's some other places that you might use for backdrops in there for pictures. Uh, so that's the plan. So meet on the front steps at 15 after, and we'll trick-or-treat and line up for parade of costumes, and then we will uh, eat uh, as soon as the parade of costumes is done. Does that work for everybody? Good to go. All right. Tenth annual trunk of treats. You're dismissed.